From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good morning and welcome to Montana This Morning. It is July 25th. It is a Monday, Miller. Monday, Monday. What a weekend that we had. Look at this video going on right here. Wrapped I mean, it up with a bang, literally. Oh, Holy yeah. Cow. Wow. A lot mm. of people sending us in pictures uh, from the Q2 app and we had a lot of hail just like that. I know the fire crews, they were out very busy Sunday putting out small grass fires mm. caused by that lightning. Even a down power line on I-90 East near 27th Street. That shut down both lanes of traffic for a while. Uh, we want to know, though, is the worst of it over? Yes, it's over. Okay. Ooh, wow, Ooh. it got crazy yesterday. I live in the West End, and it was, I was afraid that uh, the glass uh, window in the back where the glass sliding door was going to bust. Oh, yeah. Because it was coming down pretty good. The winds were blowing. The trees were bending. had some flooding as well. You can see some of this flooding uh, video here, too. We had, I, I got to tell you, maybe a record amount of photos coming in from the storm yesterday, and I'm trying to show them as we go along this morning. Thank you so much for those who have sent those in. This is what it looks like right now. You can see it's moving away. We still have a little bit of rain down to our south, uh, just north of Sheridan there along the state line over there into the uh, southeast corner of the state. Now we're going to get a bit of a break this morning, and then we're going to try to see it fire back up a little bit later on this afternoon off to our east. But this is what it looked like yesterday. You can see the storm rolling through. You can see hail was a big story yesterday. We had some trees down near Busby, down in um, Cody as well. Here locally in Billings, a lot of hail falling across the area, but it is the calm after the storm. We're looking pretty good out there right now. Beautiful sunrise captured by the Stockman Bank weather cam. 59 right now at the airport. Winds out of the west at about nine miles an hour. We'll cool down briefly tomorrow. Then we're going to warm back up and get very hot again. We'll break it all down with the main forecast coming up. Diane. Happening next month, Wyoming voters head to the polls where one of the most dominant politicians in the state's history is in a battle to secure her party's nomination. Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney is down 20 points to challenger Harriet Hageman. Now, much of this centers around the January 6th hearing. Hageman is getting a strong support from former President Trump, while Cheney is the leading GOP voice on the committee investigating the riot. Mason Dixon polling conducted this survey that first appeared in the Casper Star Tribune. The group's managing editor compared the January 6 hearings to Watergate. He says Trump supporters are going to need more evidence to flip their allegiance back to Cheney. I'll throw one caveat out there, and that is, uh, you know, if you're old enough to remember Watergate, the, uh, the Republicans stuck with Nixon for uh, quite a while. And then once they found out there were tapes of White House conversations and some of those tapes came out, they started jumping ship. So, uh, you know, <laughs> unless they've got tapes of Trump in the, in the White House on uh, the days leading up to January 6th, uh, I, don't th I don't think that's going to have, uh, you know, any kind of movement. But if, if they do, eh, you know, all bets are off at that point. But that doesn't mean Wyoming voters blindly support Trump. Just 30% said the former president's endorsement had something to do with their support for Hegeman. Political experts believe the Republican platform has moved right, leaving Cheney stuck in the middle. All of this as the House January 6th committee plans to interview more witnesses. They're prepared to subpoena Ginny Thomas, wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. She sent more than a dozen messages to President Trump's then chief of staff, Mark Meadows, urging him to pursue efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Representative Adam Schiff also said the Justice Department should open an investigation into former President Trump. This week, Congress appears to be on the verge of advancing major legislation meant to increase the production of computer chips in the United States. As reporter Joe St. George explains, the legislation does more than just help manufacturing plants. It has the possibility of transforming entire towns. Let's be real, when you're out in the country and out on the farm, what Congress is doing isn't usually top of mind. The fence building, that's all just started here recently. But when you talk to Rick Black, the county commissioner in Licking County, Ohio, he says farmers here are paying attention to D.C. a lot these days. The CHIPS Act is going to have an enormous impact, not just on this, but the whole country. You see, Intel has plans to build a multi-billion dollar computer chip manufacturing facility here on this farmland. They're starting to move dirt. However, if the CHIPS Act becomes law, this $20 billion project could morph into a $100 billion one, since the legislation incentivizes companies to build more. Hard to believe, but in three years or so, 30 football fields worth of chip plants meant to help the supply chain 
could be operating here. Did you ever think something like this would come here? No. There hasn't been a ton of optimism regarding the project lately, though. Groundbreaking was initially delayed because Congress delayed the bill for months. It seems like everything stalls. But this week, it appears as though the legislation will clear the Senate, a key step in becoming law. This community is going to be transformed dramatically by this project, but in theory, you don't have to live in Ohio to potentially benefit from the CHIPS Act. Projects like this could be coming to your state, too. I mean, it's truly a generational opportunity. As Alexis Fitzsimmons with Grow Licking County explains, the $200 billion CHIPS Act will benefit more than just this farmland. In total, Congress is set to spend $39 billion to build, expand, or modernize domestic semiconductor facilities nationwide. Projects that attract high-paying jobs. And it's about $135,000 a year average wage fully loaded with benefits. There is some opposition to this, though. Some progressives in Congress are worried this bill gives too much money to profitable corporations. Some conservatives worry spending creates inflation. An opposition that we found, though, is from many locals here. A lot of these chip plants could come to rural America. Jeremy Davis says change out here is hard. The bulk of people out here are nervous. It's going to hurt the integrity of the town. Um, kind of lose the, the small town feel. In Licking County, Ohio, I'm Joe St. George. A massive fast moving wildfire continues to burn out of control near Yosemite National Park and thousands have had to evacuate the area. The Oak Fire started Friday and has burned more than 14,000 acres. Crews say hot weather, low humidity and a third year of extreme drought are making the firefight very difficult and dangerous. In Texas, Governor Abbott declared a disaster declaration after 15 wildfires popped up across the state, destroying 16 homes in northern Texas. Heat records are breaking in the Northeast. Yesterday, triple digit temperatures set new marks in Boston and Newark, New Jersey. The nearly week long heat wave has been blamed for at least two deaths. Weather officials say the Pacific Northwest will get the next big heat wave. Temperatures could break daily records in Seattle, Portland and northern parts of California by tomorrow. Taking it over to Japan, a volcano eruption is forcing residents to evacuate. We are looking at security footage capturing the volcano lighting up the night sky and ejecting ash and large rocks more than a mile away. There are concerns lava flows and falling debris may destroy homes. So far, there are no reports of damage or casualties. This morning, we're looking into how last month's flooding in places like Red Lodge and Cook City is affecting tourism here in Billings. As Q2's David J finds out, the impact to the Magic City is nothing compared to the towns hit the hardest. A Billings hotel owner says occupancy, or the number of customers, is down about 10 to 12 percent. And the rate charged is up about 10 to 12 percent compared to the same time last year. He says that's about the same for many across the country. Now, there are markets that have come back. They're always an exception to the rule. But for the most part, business is down overall about 10 to 12 percent. Occupancy up in rate about 10 to 12 percent. So basically, revenues are flat, costs are up. Steve Warlick owns the Clock Tower Inn. Is part of the Best Western International Board, the Governor's Tourism Advisory Committee, the Montana Lodging Association, and the Billings Tourism Business Improvement District. He says hotels have recovered from COVID and the floods did not have much of an effect in Billings. The flood really hasn't impacted our business. We had a couple cancellations, people say I'm not coming, but very minimal. Warlick also owns Stella's and says restaurants face similar challenges. We're flat, so we're actually probably less customers, uh, but and our costs have gone up, as in every restaurant. In Red Lodge, with the flood damage, the restaurant business has decreased. We need to get the message back to everyone that we're open and would love to have you. Sherry Weimer is the executive director of the Red Lodge Area Chamber of Commerce and says, while flooding damaged a couple hotels, the rest are open but have not seen a lot of customers. When I meet with the lodging partners, all of them, they're all saying, they're empty. Weimer expects business to get better with the reopening of the Beartooth Pass between Red Lodge and Cook City. Some of the lodges are running at about 25 or 30 percent capacity from their normal season. Everybody's very positive here and ready to make it make it all happen again. It's not a cause for alarm, it, but there's a big cautionary flag out there. In Billings, David J. MTN News. Well, we are learning more about two Americans killed late last week in Ukraine. Brian Young from California and Luke Lucician from New Jersey were killed during an intense battle with Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. 
The men volunteered to fight against Russia's brutal assault of its neighbor. Young previously served in the U.S. military. Lucician was a father of two. Thousands of foreign volunteers are fighting alongside the Ukrainians. Most are from the U.S. President Joe Biden's condition is improving following last week's COVID-19 diagnosis. His physician says the president's main symptom right now is a sore throat. He called the development encouraging, saying it is an indication that Biden's body is clearing out the virus. The president's other symptoms, including a cough and body aches, have diminished considerably. President Biden will remain in isolation until he tests negative for COVID-19. Anticipation is building and so is the Mega Millions jackpot. No one hit Friday night's drawing, sending the prize for tomorrow swelling to $790 million. There are now only three bigger jackpots in the U.S. lottery history. Two were Mega Millions, both over a billion dollars in 2018 and 2021. The CDC is alerting doctors and public health departments after multiple states have reported cases of a type of virus that can cause life-threatening disease in infants and babies. CBS's Erin Edwards has this story of parents who lost their child and want to help other families. There is no website. The Delanceys welcomed their second child, Ronan, in May. About a week later, something wasn't right. He was fussier, he wasn't eating quite as well. Um, and he had some redness on his chest. They took him to the pediatrician who sent them home. That night, they went to the emergency room. As soon as I walked into the hospital, he stopped breathing. Then Ronan started having seizures. The family says doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. Four days later, he was diagnosed with parechovirus. It's extremely rare to find but it might not be that rare because they don't ever really look for it. Parechoviruses are common in children and typically cause mild cold-like symptoms. But infants under three months may have serious, possibly fatal infections, according to the CDC. Ronan had severe swelling and tissue damage in his brain. Going from like the best days of our lives to, you know, having our child die in our arms. The CDC recently issued this alert with doctors in multiple states reporting cases in infants. It can look like the child has what we call sepsis, which is a very severe infection, and it can also be associated with meningitis, which is basically an inflammation of the lining that surrounds the brain. The CDC encourages doctors to look for the virus in babies presenting with those symptoms. There is no antiviral treatment. Patients receive supportive care rehydration, uh, putting them on medication to suppress seizures, and giving them other forms of supportive measures that can help them while their body clears the virus. I want Ronan to have a leg legacy. I don't want another family to go through this. Ronan's parents hope sharing their story will lead to more testing for this virus. Aaron Edwards, CBS News, Hamden, Connecticut.